Welcome to Primary Care Today on ReachMD. I'm your host, Dr. Brian McDonough, and with me is Dr. Stephen Davis. Stephen Davis is a plastic and cosmetic surgeon. He's well known on the East Coast for what he does. And as a primary care physician, and for those of us listening, I want to talk a little bit today and focus on aging, anti-aging, realistic approaches to surgery, and what can be done out there to help your patients. A lot of topics, a lot of ground we're going to cover. And first of all, Dr. Davis, it's great to have you on the program. Oh, it's great to be here, Brian. Yeah, my first question, and we've known each other for quite some time, and um, you always wanted to be a surgeon, and you always felt that surgery was certainly a great way to impact people's lives. When you look at your career and where you are, have you found that to be the case? Has, have you found it to be a fulfilling career? And if it is, I hope it is, what are some of the things that you feel best about? Well, it's a great question. I'll tell you, when I was in my residency and training for plastic and reconstructive surgery and cosmetic things, our whole focus was really about surgical type things that we could do to turn the clock back. And as I've been in practice now for a little over 20 years, things have really started to swing. The pendulum has definitely started to swing into many more non-invasive, less surgical type procedures that can still try to achieve those same anti-aging or turning the clock back, if you will, type procedures. So it's a very exciting time in plastic surgery. Now, are these things, when you say non-surgical, are these things that primary care physicians could do? Is it beyond their scope? What particular things are you talking about? It's exactly what you're thinking about. You know, I'm one of the trainers that go around and teach other primary care type physicians, how to incorporate some non-surgical anti-aging procedures that they could do very easily and very capably uh, in their office setting. Some of them, however, do require some special skills or some special training that I'm not sure a lot of primary care doctors would feel that comfortable with, but as you know, Brian, with anything, the more you do of something and the more knowledge you get about it, you can become very, very, very eloquent and uh, very excellent in doing that. Let's talk about a few. What would you say are the top two or three that you would say family doctors, internists, pediatricians, primary care docs could do? Right. Well, number one on the list is Botox injections. There's a lot of patients that would really benefit from understanding the uses of something that we now call a neuromodulator or a neurotoxin. And it is something that can be taught to primary care doctors, let's say, and they can offer that to their patients, again, in the setting of this anti-aging world, I guess, one of the things that would go hand in hand with that would maybe be trying to incorporate some skin care services, things that a lot of patients would be very, very interested in understanding what types of things they could have applied to their skin or even do on their own that could help in the anti-aging process. Along with those injectables that we talked about with Botox, there are lasers that are very safe if put in the proper hands and if the proper training has been incorporated, a lot of the intense pulse light therapies that are out there, some of the names of which would be a photofacial, which just really incorporates intense pulse light. It's not really even considered a real laser. That would be something that a lot of uh, primary care physicians, I think, also would like to have in their uh, armamentarium of things to use. And the last one would be a filler, some sort of a a wrinkle filler, the names of which would be Juvederm or Restylane, those type of products which are hyaluronic fillers that can be used in a number of different places around the face. And we find that to be a really beneficial thing also to have patients feel much more youthful. What are some of the ways that primary care physicians can get in trouble? Like where do you think you see from your perspective You know, they cross over and try to do a little too much and and potentially could harm their patients. I think that what I've come across, and, you know, one of the best things about training so many patients, physicians, is that when they do feel that they're stepping into something that's a little outside of where they feel comfortable, 
I always like making sure that they know they could always call me for any kind of help or any other kind of you know judgment calls. But I think, Brian, the way you're setting up the question lends itself to understand that they really do need to know the limitations of what they're really trying to achieve with these type of injectables, let's say. We'll, we'll skip the laser discussion for a little while, but when we're talking about an injectable type product like a Botox or let's say a, a Restylane or a Juvederm uh, filler, it's very important that they're really not trying to hit a grand slam the first time they're trying to use the product. I think they have to get very comfortable in understanding what it can and can't do. And I think the number one thing that I tell all of these physicians that I've been training is you really want to have them come back once the neurotoxin, let's say, has taken its full effect. It takes somewhere between 7 to 14 days for it to really reach its max. And I think the patient benefits, as well as the doctor who injected it, to really see what their injection caused. What did it do beneficially, hopefully? And did it, you know, did you need a little bit more? Did you maybe put it in a place where you didn't really want it? And that gives you an opportunity to really see it happening. So I think that's those those things are really important just to make sure that the um, patient knows that the doctor is really trying to achieve a certain result and they're going to be very very safe and they're not going to try to over swing you know for too much of a, a grand slam type of a thing right off the bat. If you're just tuning in, you're listening to Primary Care Today on ReachMD. I'm your host, Dr. Brian McDonough. I'm speaking with Dr. Stephen Davis. He is a plastic surgeon, and we're talking a little bit about how in your own practices you can use some of these techniques. What about referring patients for plastic and cosmetic surgery? Don't have a lot of opportunities, at least in my practice, where people say, do you know the name of a good surgeon or whatever? How does that come up? Do they really seek you out? How do you get most of your referrals? Most of my referrals come from word of mouth from the patients. But uh, over the years, I really have developed a very nice uh, rapport and a relationship with a lot of family practice doctors who, you know, have gotten into a lifestyle practice. In other words, patients that come in that really want to be more physically active. So they may be turning them on to some uh, personal trainers. They may be sending them to orthopedic surgeons that may uh, help you know, some of their joints so that they're continuing to be able to play golf or tennis or do other things because their age is getting, you know, higher in the years, but they still feel great. They still feel very youthful, and they want to continue to participate in all the sporting things and just to live a very youthful lifestyle. What goes hand-in-hand with that, I've seen in my practice firsthand, is, is the idea that if they really feel that young, they definitely want to look that young. So you'd be surprised, Brian, some of the patients that come in and really it just brings a lot of joy to them to be able to look in the mirror and go, you know what, I really feel great. I'm doing all these physical activities. Some, they say they're in better shape now in their older years than they were when they were younger, and they love looking in the mirror and knowing that, you know, a little bit of this rejuvenation, if you will, is also, you know, looking back at them in the mirror and going, wow, I really feel great. I'm looking good. And, and it's a great thing, I think, overall for, you know, family practice doctors and internists to really see the benefits of some of these anti-aging type of uh, procedures. What are dangers out there? Things that maybe there are promises that are being made in the media, things that might be on television, talk shows that that we should be worrying about for our, our own patients and saying, you know, stay away from this. This is a concern. Well, absolutely. From the way you asked that question, Brian, I know that it's a very skilled uh, and uh, you, you've seen patients probably that have had some bad results. So I'm going to go back to what I said almost in the very beginning, which is the doctors that are really going to get involved in actually doing these things and not just referring them out. They need to know what the limitations of these type of products and non-invasive type procedures are. If you see a patient, and that's one of the first things that I do when I'm doing my trainings, 
is that I really try to make sure that they recognize who is a candidate for these kinds of things that you can do and who's not a candidate for these things that you can do. And I think that's just as important. So a woman that comes in that absolutely 100% needs a facelift, you could put as much Botox and fillers in that patient, and they're never going to be happy, and they're never going to get a result that they really, really want. Fortunately, there aren't really a lot of dangers, per se, that you could get into if you really do follow the rules in how to go about injecting these things. One of the best things about the hyaluronic fillers is there's something called hyaluronidase, which is almost like the antidote. So if you inject it into an area that you don't love and the patient doesn't love it, you can piggyback right behind it this hyaluronidase and it literally will dissolve the product. So there are a lot of things that you can do to really make a lot of beneficial maneuvers. You just need to know what the limitations of these products and procedures are. You know, I remember years ago I interviewed a doctor who I'm sure you know, Dr. Peter Coggins, and I always remember him saying um, when he was talking about it, he said that when you do a procedure on a patient, it isn't really about what they look like in the first year or so. It's 10 years later. His fear is that he'll see somebody walking down the beach in 10 years who looks just terrible because he didn't anticipate the body and structural changes that could occur as someone gets older. Is that something you have to do, kind of look at that and anticipate? Yeah, and, and he's one of the best at that, and it's also because he's had so many years of experience in doing it. And as well as I now, into you know over the 20 years of experience doing plastic surgery, I can guarantee you that that's one of the things that if you talk to any experienced plastic surgeon, they're going to say that would be the thing that would ultimately haunt them is to think that they caused something that down the road became a problem. And that's why new players in this field of plastic surgery or cosmetic surgery really need to have um, that kind of um, understanding. And that's why just dabbling in these non-invasive type of procedures is a bad idea. Uh, you probably know as well, there are some fabulous hair transplant surgeons. I'm going to go right to that as one of the ones that have written books on doing hair transplants. And the ones from years ago turned out to be emergency room physicians, other type of doctors that really got very involved in hair transplant surgery. And they kind of devoted their entire career to really learning and becoming expert in that. So it doesn't really matter a lot of times the actual course you started out in. It kind of does make a lot of difference, though, how vested you really get in trying to become expert in it. And I think that's one of the big problems that I see in patients that go to get some of these cosmetic procedures done by people that are really just dabbling in it. And God forbid, sometimes it's even in somebody that wants to start doing facelifts in the office or liposuction-type procedures that they may have taken a course in, and all of a sudden they may think that they're really expert in this, and they don't really understand the uh, intricacies of what they could be causing down the road, as you said. Getting a little bit into the development of a surgeon, the mind of a surgeon, I know you were very athletic. You played a lot of tennis, played college tennis. Did athletics impact your approach to surgery? Does it ever come into play in the operating room since there is kind of an, an art to surgery that's a little different than other fields? I, I love that question because I really think it does. When I was doing my cosmetic surgery fellowship in Beverly Hills, um, I'll never forget I actually asked the surgeon that I was with did he ever play sports? And he said, yeah. And you could just tell by uh, the fluidity in his maneuvers and how he was um, holding things and how he was just very athletically going about doing the procedures. And I do think that the two um, different things that really enter into a surgeon's, um, let's say, wherewithal to be able to do these things in a very uh, beautiful way is an artistic eye or some sort of an artistic capability and also an athletic kind of feel for things. And I think, you know, when you see 
really unbelievable surgeons at work, I think most of them really do have a flair for those types of things. So it's an interesting question, but I do think you're right. There's something that, there's something to that. Well, Dr. Steve Davis, we've run out of time. I want to thank you for joining. It was a pleasure being on with you, Brian, and I appreciate all the things that you do. This is Dr. Brian McDonough. If you missed any or part of this discussion, please visit ReachMD.com slash Primary Care today to download the podcast. Once again, thank you very much for listening.